So today, we're diving into the world of logic puzzles. Towards the end of the show, today we will uh, we will explore the world of Sudoku, uh, including performative Sudoku. There's like people watching other people do Sudoku uh, and really hard Sudoku. I, I have to be honest and say I've actually never done a Sudoku. Uh, anyway, we have a lot of other things to talk about with logical puzzles. You know, you might sit there thinking, well, why should I care about this? Obviously, there's some of us who enjoy this kind of thing because in my case, I'm in my mid 60s. It's a way to figure out how many of my marbles I'm still hanging on to. But I think it's also kind of everywhere in our professions, maybe more than we realize. Not for nothing did the fictional creators of the TV show House take the style and personality to some degree of the ultimate fictional puzzle solver, Sherlock Holmes, and translate it into the world of medicine. Because medicine, when it's not cut and dried, medicine is a long series of logic puzzles. We gave this patient the usual medicine. He didn't get better. Why? We gave this patient a good medicine. She got worse. Why is that? What are the underlying factors? What are all the things that we do? Why is this patient behaving differently, uh, reacting differently than most patients? It's there in engineering. I mean, think about the uh, uh, movie Apollo 13. Think about all the puzzles that they have to solve. Now, not all of them may fit into the most platonic description uh, of logical puzzles, uh, but they're out there all the time. For example, and cat, get ready for A1. For example, you could be tormented by a terrorist who turned out to be Jeremy Irons, and he would want you to know how to solve puzzles like this one. I trust you see the message. It has a proximity circuit, so please don't run. Yeah, I got it. We're not going to run. Now we turn this thing off. On the fountain, there should be two jugs. Do you see them? A five gallon and a three gallon. Fill one of the jugs with exactly four gallons of water and place it on the scale, and the timer will stop. You must be precise. One ounce or more or less will result in detonation. If you're still alive in five minutes, we'll speak. Wait, wait a sec! I don't get it. You get it? No. All right. See, you need to get it. Uh, otherwise, you're going to blow up. So that's another reason to care about all this stuff. Uh, joining us now is Jason Rosenhaus, a professor of mathematics at James Madison University uh, and the author of books about math and related topics. His next book, Games for Your Mind, The History and Future of Logic Puzzles, come out in, no, comes out in November. Jason Rosenhaus, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, you know, I, just to go back there, that was Die Hard for those of you who haven't watched it 15 <laughs> times the way I have. But uh, that was Die Hard. I, I don't know whether that's exactly a logic puzzle, the way you would define a logic puzzle, this whole thing with the jugs of water. I mean, it does have a solution, right? Yes. Uh, uh, strictly speaking, I'd say it's not really a logic puzzle. Uh, I do remember seeing that movie in the theater and uh, getting very excited <laughs> when that scene uh, came up. I almost wanted to pause it at that point so I could try to solve the puzzle myself. Um, yeah, it's not strictly a logic puzzle because it's really more uh, involving arithmetic uh, and uh, you know, numerical manipulation. Um, whereas uh, by logic puzzle, I mean a puzzle that's solved just by, by pure logic alone, just by reasoning alone. No algebra, no arithmetic, um, you know, nothing like that. All right, so let's take let's take a really uh, fundamental one. Uh, th this is often uh, posed in different ways, but I think uh, you rely on the terminology knights and knaves. Knights always tell the truth. Knaves never tell the truth. So give us sort of that basic bedrock uh, logical puzzle involving the knight and the knave. Right. So yeah. So um, this is sort of a genre of puzzle that uh, it has a very long history, uh, going back uh, you know at least to the eighteen hundreds. Um, but uh, it was really uh, brought to a high art by Raymond Smolian, who was uh, a mathematician who specialized in logic. And yeah, he, he developed these puzzles featuring characters called knights and knaves. Uh, and as you said, knights always tell the truth uh, and knaves always lie. And then the idea is that you're supposed to imagine that you're visiting their island and uh, you meet some people and you don't know whether they're knights or they're knaves and they make for certain statements. And then you try to reason your way uh, to certain conclusions based on what they say. Okay, so as sort of a, like a like a warm up puzzle uh, to uh, get used to this, um, you know, if you're on this island, could anyone ever say to you, uh, "I am a knave"? So let's start with that. Is that a possible thing that someone could say? Well, so yeah, you're asking me. So if if a knight said it, it wouldn't be true. If a knave said it, it would be true. But knaves never tell the truth. Exactly. 
Right. So, so that's impossible, right? A knight would never say, I am a knave, because he would be lying by saying that. And a knave would never say, I am a knight, because he would be telling the truth. Okay, so that's sort of a, sort of a basic principle. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's try a slightly harder puzzle. Uh, you know, suppose uh, you're, you're walking along the island uh, and you meet uh, two people, okay? And uh, one of them says to you, uh, at least one of us is a knave. Uh, now, what would you conclude? Okay, this is harder. Um, at least one of us is a knave. So if it's a knight, he could be talking about the other person. Um, if it's a knave, then neither one of them uh, is, uh, is, an, is a knave. So... Well, this, well but if the, if the speaker is a knave, right? Yeah, right. Then, then one of them is a knave. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. OK. But although if he's saying at least one of us is a knave and he never never tells the truth, then neither one of them is a knave. Right. So well, so we have a contradiction. Right. You know, right. If, if I'm a knave. Right. I couldn't possibly say at least one of us is a knave because it's actually true yeah. that at least one of them is a knave. Right. right? Yeah. Namely, he is himself a knave. Right. So that would be a contradiction. Right. Right. So it's, okay. the probability so is that the person speaking is a knight and he's referring to the other person. Yeah, it's not just a possibility, it's 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 necessary. That that's the only that's the only scenario that's consistent. Right. In other words, it must be that the person who says at least one of us is a knave, the person who says that must actually be a knight. And then for his statement to be true, it must be that the other person is actually a knave. Right. So the speaker is a knight and the other person is a knave. Right. We'll come back to that kind of thinking too, maybe towards the end of the segment. We're going to talk about the two girls with muddy faces. But I want to, yeah. before we do that, Jason, and I don't, once again, don't know whether you would consider this a logic uh, problem, but it is a problem that you know a lot about. And so, but let me just set this up. In the 90s, and I see the 90s because I think it went on for more than one year, America, a certain segment, a fairly large segment of America was convulsed about a specific uh, probability problem. Uh, and it was called the Monty Hall problem. Uh, it was introduced to the public by Marilyn Vos Savant, who was celebrated at the time, and I, I think not so much anymore, as the person in America with the highest IQ. She had this column in Parade Magazine. She introduced this problem, and she gave her, or she was asked this question from her mailbag, I guess, gave her answer to it, and really just fights broke out all over America. She got at least 10,000 pieces of mail, most of it saying that she was wrong. People who were prominent in the world of math denounced her. Um, people who had important jobs in the Defense Department using math denounced her. People who had university positions. Yeah, that, 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 and, that's basically right. Yeah. So so tell us a little bit more about the about this problem, because, I mean, I, the last thing I want to say before you start talking is like people had really big fights at like dinner parties and stuff. I mean, it really kind of crossed into the mainstream and people would have bitter arguments about this in social situations, uh, some of which I'm actually personally aware of. Anyway, yeah. Give, give us a sense of what that problem was. Yeah, I, I know just what you're talking about, because this is the, you know, the rare math problem uh, that people really get angry about. People really get emotional about it. And uh, you know, I kind of like the fact that, that people can get uh, really passionate about a math problem. Uh, I just wish it was, uh, you know, the reasoning was more cogent. Uh, yeah, it wasn't just that people took issue with Marilyn Vos Savant. Uh, it was that they angrily took issue with her. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the problem, just, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to assume people know uh, what the problem is. Uh, it, it came up from a, a, a game show uh, from the 1970s uh, called Let's Make a Deal. Uh, and the, the host of the show was named Monty Hall, hence the term the Monty Hall problem. And um, the problem is this. Uh, you imagine that you're on a game show and you're confronted with three doors. Uh, and you know that behind one of the doors is a car. And, that's, and that, of course, is the prize that you want. And then behind the other two doors, uh, there are goats. And on the game show, it was, it was literal goats, literal farm animals, you know, like Sandy goat. And um, so Monty Hall says, uh, you know, the three doors are identical as far as you know. And uh, Monty Hall says, pick one of the doors. And you say, okay, I'll, I'll pick door number one. Okay, so you, so you point to door number one. You do not open it. Uh, and then Monty, uh, who, of course, knows where the car is, he opens one of the other two doors and shows you a goat. Let's say he opens door three and shows you that it's a goat. Okay, so you pick door one. Monty opened door three and showed you a goat. And now he gives you uh, a choice. He says, either stick with your original choice or switch to door number two. Okay, and then you make your choice and you win whatever's behind your door. Okay, so the problem is, what choice should you make to maximize your chances of winning the car? Uh, okay, so anyway, that's the setup of the problem. And uh, the reason it gets uh, so much uh, controversy is that um, uh, you know, most people will say uh, that it's a 50-50 choice at that mm -hmm. point. 
right? I mean, like, what, what do you know after Monty opens his door? You know door three uh, is out of the game, okay? But door one and door two are still there, and those are equally likely as far as you know. Uh, so most people say it's 50-50. It, it just doesn't matter whether you stick or you switch. And then the uh, sort of the twist ending here uh, is that actually it matters a great deal and that you actually double your chances of winning uh, by switching to the other door. Um, so, that, yeah, that's the puzzle. And that, that solution is, uh, seems to be very counterintuitive for people. And that was kind of what my first book was about, uh, about the Monty Hall problem, uh, both about uh, how people reason about this problem and also the mathematics uh, underlying it. Right. Uh, uh, let me attempt. So we should say that Marilyn Vos Savant correctly said that you, sh you, you should switch doors. You sh should switch from door one to door two. And that's what pe made people so mad. And, and people, you know, as I said, with very impressive math uh, backgrounds denounced her. This being the 90s, it was often made about gender, too. She was accused of using women's logic or <laughs> women's reasoning or something. Yeah. But, the, but the truth is, if you run computer simulations of this, it quickly becomes clear that that. Marilyn Vos Savant and and therefore you are correct. Uh, you are both yeah. knights, not knaves. Uh, you you actually do double your chances of winning by switching doors. Yeah, and and in fact, this um, uh, this this got covered on the front page of the New York Times when the controversy broke out. And and yeah, and you're absolutely right. Marilyn Vos Savant gave the right answer, um, and uh, and a lot of her uh, you know her uh, uh, interlocutors uh, you know uh, just angrily you know were themselves mathematicians and said no, this is just wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, the funny thing is, this problem actually has a longer history. Well, like Marilyn Vos Savant brought it to the, the wider uh, public, uh, but um, but among mathematicians, this problem was known uh, going actually well back, at least to the 1940s. Uh, it was actually Martin Gardner in the 1950s in his Scientific American column, uh, you know, wrote wrote a, an essay about something uh, mathematically equivalent to the Monty Hall problem, uh, and there was actually a, a, a brouhaha about it in an academic journal. Um, a, a professional statistician. Uh, published a letter to the editor, this is like 1975, uh, he published a letter to the editor in a statistics journal, an academic statistics journal, saying, hey, here's this wonderful little brain teaser that I like to use in class. And he gave the right answer in his letter. And then, and then this journal, this staid, stocky uh, academic journal that most people wouldn't pay any attention to, uh, they got deluged <laughs> with letters. Uh, and that was in the 70s. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, I, I mentioned in my book that uh, I, I, I do this with my students in, 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 you know, in class all the time. And uh, it's the one time they, they won't defer to me, right? You know, normally, if we're arguing about <laughs> mathematics, uh, they're kind of gracious enough to assume I know more about math than they do. Uh, but on that one, they say, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And um, uh, I kind of like that, though. I kind of like that they argue back at me. It, it is true. Like today... I'm very familiar with this. I lived through it in the 90s. I took a walk today and thought it over again. And where I was thinking was that the way that my thinking was working, I don't know if it's quite the right way to solve it, is that um, at the beginning, you've chosen door one. So you have a one third chance of being right. And, and there's a two thirds chance of it being either door number B or, or door number C or whatever we're going to call them. Um, so um, when door number three or door C gets opened, that two thirds chance kind of collapses onto that middle door. Uh, and, and and that's why it is. But I don't know the more as I was walking the dog, I changed my mind about it four or five times. There's some way in which our minds resist the logic of that. Yeah, uh, you know, one helpful way to sit, just to kind of get an idea of what's going on is imagine that you have, say, 100 doors, you know, instead of three doors, and, and you pick door one, and then Monty uh, eliminates, say, doors two through 99. So it's only doors one and 100 are left. Uh, in that situation, I think most people would say, well, gee, you know, yeah, with 100 doors to choose from, you know, it's very unlikely you know, that you chose the right door. And uh, so, you know, you know, of course, you're, you're, you know, of course, it's more likely to be behind mm -hmm. the other door. Uh, so in that very exaggerated case, I think it's, the logic is a little bit easier to see. Uh, I actually, I, I, I presented that argument in class once, and I actually had a student uh, argue back and he say, well, that's fine for 100 doors, but for three doors, it's 50-50. <laughs> and um, uh, I had a hard time convincing her otherwise. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, th those are good ways of, of looking at it. And actually, what you described, I think, is very cogent. Uh, mathematically, uh, I, I think there's more to say that, uh, you know, if you really try to get into the probability theory of the kind of thing you know, really try to calculate what the probability is at different times and you need uh, you need a, a, a piece of machinery called Bayes theorem for this and um, uh, the, the issues are remarkably subtle uh, because that you know what, what you said about you know the two-thirds probability collapsing on one door um, that actually depends very subtly on certain initial conditions in the problem mm -hmm. and uh, I can subtly change those conditions and suddenly uh, come up with a very different answer to the puzzle um, uh, 
And uh, yeah, so mathematically, it's a really fascinating problem. Uh, but culturally, it's fascinating just because it, it just seems so simple. It just seems so obvious that the 50 50 solution is correct. Right. Uh, and so, and that's a good, uh, we're, we're going to break. I think when we come back, we should talk a little bit about that too, because it's sort of interesting the way logic, it has a hard time existing out on some plane of platonic purity. There are always sort of human factors and our emotional overlays that come into it. And it may be why we do so much enjoy uh, fiction, where there are these creatures of pure logic. You'll meet some of them on the other side of the break. All right, we are back, uh, and we are talking about uh, logic puzzles, uh, and we are talking about uh, logic puzzles in several different contexts uh, with Jason Rosenhaus, professor of mathematics at James Madison University and the author of a number of books about math and related topics. His next book, Games for Your Mind, The History and Future of Logic Puzzles, come out in November. So, um, so yeah, there's a way in which I think we're very attracted to when we are setting out to be entertained. Uh, these creatures who are able to somehow or other uh, isolate themselves or, or brush away all the human factors which muddy up a situation uh, and um, behave in the realm of pure logic. And, you know, I, I mentioned Sherlock Holmes is perhaps the ultimate of those, but maybe the ultimate ultimate of those was this guy. Mm. History is replete with turning points, Lieutenant. You must have faith. Faith? That the universe will unfold as it should. But is that logical? Surely we must. Logic, logic, and logic. Logic is the beginning of wisdom, Valeris, not the end. So, uh, Jason, uh, one of the things that you do write about are these fictional figures. Uh, you were just hearing Mr. Spock. I hope I don't have to explain that to anybody, you know, at this point in human history. You should know Mr. Spock. Um, but maybe say a little bit about this. There, there is there's a way in which, you know, we have a term these days called competence porn, like it's movies like The Martian or shows like The West Wing, where you just it's very exciting to see how smart and able and competent everybody is. This is sort of different, though. This is sort of logic porn, right? You're seeing... You're you're seeing people being more logic and methodical than most people are. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's something to that. You know, what, one of the themes of the book is that, uh, you know, for most people, if you pick up a textbook in logic, uh, it's deadly dull. Uh, you know, even frankly, even a lot of mathematicians look at logic textbooks and say, you know, what are you studying that for? Uh, and yet people, you know, like logic puzzles. Uh, you mentioned Sudoku. Uh, Sudoku is a logic puzzle, right? The, 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 uh, the initial clues are, are given information and you reason from those clues to try to figure out where the other numbers go. And yeah, as you mentioned, yeah, with the, like with the Sherlock Holmes stories uh, and other sort of um, uh, you know classical uh, detective stories, uh, a lot of the fun is seeing uh, you know a, a logic maven uh, you know use his awesome reasoning abilities uh, to, to to foil evil and uh, fight bad guys. And uh, yeah, I actually have a whole chapter in the book precisely about uh, detective stories. I call it logic fiction, kind of paralleling science fiction. And uh, yeah, a lot of the satisfaction of these stories. Um, you know, if you, I'm thinking about authors like Agatha Christie or Ellery Queen or John Dixon Carr, uh, you know, who wrote, you know, I mean, they, they were really logic puzzles in the form of novels. And, you know, these novels were, you know, especially in their own time, were you know, just incredibly successful and not because of the tremendous literary value of these works. You know, you don't read this, uh, you don't read novels like this uh, for the, uh, the, you know, the searing social commentary or the, or the richly drawn characters. You read it just because it's so much fun to see the chain of logical inferences at the end. Uh, that leads to the bad guy uh, being brought to justice. And people tend to like that kind of story. And people tend to like uh, you know, Sudoku puzzles, even while at the same time having no interest in actually taking, a, you know, say, a college course in, uh, in formal logic. And that's, and that's one of the big themes of the book, that on the one hand, uh, you have you know, formal mathematical logic, which for most people is just not their cup of tea. And yet then you have this more uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, everyday sort of reason, or the reason behind puzzles that a lot of people do enjoy. And kind of the point I make in the book is that it's very hard to draw a line between where the where the fun puzzles end and kind of the deep mathematical and philosophical questions begin. 
Uh, and that's kind of one of the themes of the book. Well, you know, I, I was going to ask you kind of a, a variant of that question, which is, so when you look at them that way, do do the does the reasoning of Hercule Poirot or Sherlock Holmes, I don't know, would they get good grades in your class? Are they, in fact, hewing closely enough to classical logic to to make the grade in your universe? Well, you, you, you certainly have to take some of it with a grain of salt. Um, you know, it was uh, uh, you know, it's not that they commit, you know, formal logical fallacies, uh, but but it is kind of a, you know, a hallmark of this kind of literature that uh, they will draw inferences and deductions that are very far from airtight. Uh, so like in, in deductive logic, uh, you usually think of things being, you know, absolutely uh, dead certain. Like if I say, um, uh, if it rains, then I will go to the movies. And then it does rain. Well, okay, then I better go to the movies or, or I lied to you, right? I mean, it's that, you know, it's that deductively certain. It's just what the words mean. And, uh, you know, the kinds of things that, you know, Sherlock Holmes was doing or Hercule Poirot or any of these other characters, uh, their inferences were never airtight you know, in quite that sense. Um, so, uh, yeah, so you, you do have to keep that in mind. Um, but, uh, but that said, it was kind of close enough uh, to be, uh, you know, very entertaining. And, uh, and often, you know, the very implausibility of some of their inferences is a lot of the, the fun of the story, uh, at least in my view. Right. And I think it was also kind of a time, you know, a lot of this is sort of late 19th century, early 20th century, where that kind of exaltation of logic, you know, rang a nice bell, kicked a pretty good uh, tripwire uh, for people. So as we think about that, well, let's let's give an example that's a little bit more almost literally pedestrian. Uh, and it's something that you use in your classes. It's, I believe, from a short story in which one of the characters says that it, given a, a sentence of between 10 and 12 words, he can draw a whole series of inferences. So, uh, Jason, you take the story from there. Right. So, uh, yeah, so this is a short story that was published uh, late 1940s uh, by a fellow named Harry Kemmelman. Uh, the story was called The Nine Mile Walk. Uh, and it was a, a short story. It was published in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. And yeah, the premise of the story is that, the, the, like the whole story is just a dialogue uh, between uh, you know, a first person narrator and, and actually an English professor in this case. And uh, the English pre professor uh, challenges the other guy, says, look, give me any sentence of 10 to 12 words and I'll draw you a chain of inferences that you never dreamed of uh, when you formulated the sentence. And, uh, and, and sometime later, uh, the narrator comes back with a sentence, a nine mile walk is no joke especially in the ring. And, uh, and then the story proceeds from there. And the English professor starts drawing inferences uh, you know, from, you know, from, uh, you know, from the sentence uh, itself. And, uh, and of course, this was, this was a story in a, in a mystery magazine. So eventually the chain of inferences leads uh, to a, a rather shocking uh, conclusion. I, I don't want to say too much. I, I will just mention to the audience, uh, this story is freely available online. Uh, just search on the nine mile walk. And then you can read it about 10 minutes. It's really quite short. And uh, yeah, I mentioned that um, uh, I often use that in, in, in my math classes. Um, we offer something called uh, an introduction to proof points. Uh, the idea being that for most people, mathematics is about arithmetic and calculation, but for mathematicians, it's really about abstract argument and logical proof. And uh, so we often have a class where we're introducing students to the ideas underlying proofs. And I'll use this story uh, as a sort of a lighthearted introduction. Say, see how much fun deductive reasoning can be. You know, here's this sentence that most people wouldn't really conclude anything from. Uh, and yet in the context of the story, uh, it just leads, you know, inference that, you know, one inference leads to another, to another. And then pretty soon there's a, you know, a suitably shocking uh, you know, conclusion. So, um, yeah, so I think we should just uh, let people uh, read the story. We don't want to wreck any of the surprises in it. Let's go back to, for our listeners, um, once again, a relatively simple but not all that simple, a logic problem. Let's do the one about the two sisters who've been out also perhaps in the rain or at least in some weather conditions uh, likely to make mud. So, uh, Jason, right. you take the story from there. Yeah, so this is the, this is the so-called muddy children problem, M-U-D-D-Y, the muddy children problem. And uh, yeah, this is a classic, and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to state, but it's actually, um, uh, it, it takes some time to wrap your head around it, I think. Um, uh, and the, the, so the basic version of the puzzle is this. Uh, we imagine uh, two girls uh, outside uh, playing, and uh, we assume that it rained recently, so there's a lot of mud. Uh, and sure enough, each of the little girls uh, ends up with a spot of mud on their face. Uh, and each girl can see the other one, can see that the other one has a muddy face, uh, but she doesn't know whether or not her own face is muddy. Uh, and, and we assume, of course, she doesn't have a mirror, and, uh, and in the context of the puzzle, she's not allowed to feel her forehead 
to see if there's any mud on it. Okay, so both girls have a spot of mud. Each girl can see the other one, but each girl also does not know whether she has a spot of mud. Okay, so uh, their father, who was a logician, decides to teach them a lesson in logic, and he has them stand facing each other. And he says, uh, he says to them, um, uh, at least one of you has a muddy fist. Okay, and then he says, now step forward. Uh, you know, if you know whether or not your own face is muddy. And of course, the, the, the two girls, uh, you know, they, they just stay where they are, right? The father told them at least one of them has a muddy face, uh, but they already knew that because they could see that the other girl has a muddy face. Okay, so neither one does anything. So after a few minutes, the father repeats the question. He says, okay, now if you know whether or not you have a muddy face, uh, step forward. And the question is, well, what happens now? Uh, at this point, can the girls deduce that they must have a muddy face? Uh, okay, so that's the puzzle. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there you go. <laughs> right. And so the, we should say the solution is that now they know because they've watched their sister, each, each has watched her sister's behavior. So, exactly. so, so yeah. based on the fact that her sister didn't step forward, uh, you know, person, person a knows that she must also have mud on her face because her yeah, sister exactly. also was right. So the idea is that the second time the father asked the question, both girls step forward because actually both of them now know that each has a muddy face. And, and the reasoning, the, the, the reason they know this is that uh, each girl, uh, let, let, let's look at it from one of the girls. She says, she, she looks at the other and sees the other has a muddy face and says, okay, my father says at least one of us has a muddy face, but I already knew that because I can see my, my, my sister. Uh, okay, um, but then you know, the, 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 the girl will start reasoning, well, wait a minute, is it possible that my face is clean? Well, let's suppose my face actually were clean. Then, then my sister, right, would be looking at me and would see a clean face but she knows that one of them has a muddy face. And therefore she would know that she must be the one that has, that has a muddy face, right? If one of them is muddy and, and one of them can see that the other one is not muddy, then she must be the one with the muddy face. So when neither one steps forward, both girls go through this reasoning and say, oh, so it can't be that my sister is looking at a clean face because then she would have stepped forward. So I now, so now I do know that I have a muddy face. And, and I, I, a way I like to put this is that, you know, when the father says, uh, at least one of you has a muddy face. Well, they already knew that. So they don't learn anything from the statement itself. Mm. However, they do learn something from the way their sister reacted uh, to, to that information. And that's kind of the subtle point uh, you know, of the puzzle. So Jason, I sort of wonder whether that, this puzzle slides one of its espadrilles over the line of game theory uh, in, in the sense that the initial question that's posed can't be answered on the initial set of evidence available. It's really the behavior of the two players in the story, which provide each player with a needed but heretofore missing piece of information. I feel like I don't really know what I'm talking about, but I feel like we're getting pretty close to game theory there. Yeah, well, there's an element of truth in what you're talking about. Um, uh, in that uh, both uh, both game theory and, and, and this puzzle both involve uh, you know making judgments about people's reactions to things. But I, I but I think there's actually an important difference between uh, the muddy children puzzle uh, and game theory. That in game theory, uh, the whole idea is that you're being forced to make decisions uh, in the face of imperfect information. In other words, you're playing a game kind of loosely construed, uh, and you don't know what the other players are going to do. And the fact that you don't know what the other players are going to do influences you know what, what's in your best interest to do. and that that's kind of the basic idea of what game theory is about uh here it's a little bit different here it is true you're, you're drawing inferences based on what other people do but but in this case it really is a matter of deductive logic that that it really does follow uh you know, un, uh, you know un, uh, unambiguously that that each girl can reason her way to the conclusion that the that her own face must be muddy so that that's the that's the distinction between the two that the muddy children problem really is a problem in deductive logic Whereas game theory is all about, uh, you know, what's the wisest decision to make uh, given the imperfect information that you have. Right. So this last puzzle, we're, we're going to talk about a puzzle, but we're not going to do it because it's too hard. In fact, it is sometimes referred to as the hardest puzzle ever. Uh, it, it has some kinship with the first puzzle we talked about, the Knights and Knaves. But we've been doing puzzles now where I, I think with the first Knights and Knaves thing with the girls with muddy faces, uh, you know, you can pretty clearly, pretty quickly, quickly grasp how you could have solved that problem, even if you didn't solve it. Here, we're going to go to a different realm, but we just want to show you how complicated things can get. So Jason, uh, give us a quick uh, sketch of the hardest puzzle ever. Yeah. So, so this was a lot of fun. I, I had a lot of fun writing this chapter in the book. It's the longest chapter in the book, actually. 
Uh, and yeah, uh, the puzzle is literally called the hardest logic puzzle ever. Uh, you, you could literally type that into Google uh, and find uh, you know, an awful lot of information about it, uh, starting with actually a pretty good uh, article at Wikipedia uh, describing all the ins and outs. And uh, the puzzle itself is not hard to state. It's, you know, it's, not, it's not hard to state, it's hard to solve. Um, so I, I can state the puzzle. And the puzzle is this. Uh, you're confronted with three gods. It's always presented very melodramatically like that, three gods. And one of the gods only makes true statements. One of the gods only makes false statements. Uh, and the third god uh, answers randomly. You ask him a question and he just decides on the spur of the moment whether he's going to tell the truth or whether he's going to lie. And of course, you don't know which god is which. And uh, your task is to ask them no more than three yes-no questions. And based on their answers to those questions, you have to identify who's the true God, who's the false God, and who's the random God. But wait, there's a catch. And the catch is, even though the gods speak English perfectly, right, they'll answer in their own language. And in their own language, the words for yes and no are da and ja, but you don't know which one means yes and which one means no. Okay? So, uh, so let's take it from the top. You have one God who only makes true statements, one who only makes false statements, one who answers randomly, and they will answer any yes, no question, but they answer in a language where the words for yes and no are da and ja, and you don't know which word means what. So you don't know who you're talking to, and you don't know what their answers mean, <laughs> and how you have to do this with, uh, with just three questions. And, uh, and the backstory on this, uh, this was actually introduced in, uh, in um, 1996, uh, not, not that long ago. Uh, and um, uh, it was a, 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 a philosopher named George Bulos uh, who introduced the puzzle, and, and, and he gave a solution to the puzzle. Uh, and, and suffice it to say, his solution is enormously complicated, uh, you know, far, far too complicated than we could possibly discuss here. Uh, the questions he came up with are these very intricate, logically complex questions uh, that uh, require the better part of an afternoon to, to analyze. And um, so, so that's interesting right there. But the reason it's the longest chapter in the book is that after the initial solution was presented, you know, you can't present something called the hardest logic puzzle ever to a room full of mathematicians and expect that to just be taken lying down. Okay, people are going to say, oh, it's not that hard. And um, there was a, a, a slew of papers that came after it, uh, first simplifying the original solution, saying actually you can get by with simpler questions, and then considering uh, ever more difficult and ever more complicated versions of the puzzle uh, to the point where uh, there's a whole industry of papers uh, describing the nuances of this puzzle. And, uh, and that's, that's what this chapter in the book is about. And uh, yeah, and it really gets, um, uh, it, it's fascinating, uh, but really bizarre <laughs> yeah, as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so I had, a, I had a lot of fun writing that chapter in the book. And, right. uh, and it's worth the effort, uh, pacing through some of the other Yes, yeah, it's worth the effort or your head will explode. One of those two yes. things. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to switch, uh, jump tracks here a little bit and go to uh, Sudoku. Uh, and Jason will stay here for this. But we're also going to meet an actual Sudoku celebrity. I think that's fair to say. I'm turning off life support. I'm putting an end to this joke. The tiger thought about this and then the tiger spoke. All right, so it's time for me to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Kat Pastor. She's there in the studio making it possible for me and Jonathan McPants to work remotely. Jonathan McPants is the producer of this particular episode. Um, I should say that tomorrow we are doing a show about McCarthyism and about Joe McCarthy himself and probably a little bit more generally speaking about demagoguery and how consistent its patterns are. And no, this has absolutely nothing to do with the convention that's taking place this week. Not at all. So um, we're talking right now about puzzles, however. Uh, Jason Rosenhaus, so you've met professor of mathematics at James Madison University. Uh, and uh, his books include, more relevantly this time to this particular segment, Taking Sudoku Seriously, The Math Behind the World's Most Popular Pencil Puzzle. And now joining us also is Simon Anthony, one of the two hosts of Cracking the Cryptic, a YouTube channel, a former UK team member in the World Sudoku and World Puzzle Championships, uh, and the subject of a lot of articles, too. Uh, a lot of articles writing about how a certain segment of the world became uh, fascinated simply by watching him solve a, a Sudoku uh, problem. It turns out to be more of a spectator game than at least I had realized. But so first of all, uh, Simon Anthony, welcome to our show. Thank you, Colin, for having me on. So um, I think for people who are 
novices out there, uh, people who are Sudoku versions, uh, it might be worth uh, you, Simon, taking a moment to tell us, you know, basically what Sudoku is. Well, it's a very simple logic problem um, where you're faced with a nine by nine grid, which is split up into nine three by three grids. And the base, basic idea is you have to fill in the numbers from one to nine in each row, in each column, and in each three by three box. And that's all there is to it. And I think part of its appeal is that simplicity. Well, there's not all there is to it, right? There are certain kind of <laughs> strictures about you know what you can put in and what you what you can't do more than once and things like that, right? Yes, you have to put in each number just once at each row, column, and box. So that that provides quite a, a meaningful constraint. And then after that, there are lots of variations that that build on that basic rule set. Um, let me flip. Uh, let me flip back over to Jason for a second. So, what makes this? I, I think first of all, I should say I know nothing about. Well, I know more about it now than I knew a week ago. But I don't pretend to know anything about Sudoku. But I think most people think of it as a math puzzle. Uh, if if they don't if they don't play it, they would. Uh, Jason think of it as a math puzzle. What makes it a logic puzzle? Uh, well, I, I um, uh, first I just want to sort of go into fanboy mode for a moment because I love cracking <laughs> the cryptic. So I was really excited to uh, be on with Simon. And uh, but what Simon said was correct. Uh, it, it's it, it's a logic puzzle. You know, people often assume it's a math puzzle just because it uses numbers. Uh, and um, uh, you know, numbers kind of suggest uh, arithmetic and mathematics people. But really, it's a straight up logic puzzle that you're drawing. Uh, you know, uh, deductive inferences. You know, based on the other numbers that have already been filled into the grid. And um, uh, you know, it's really striking just how much people you know enjoy these puzzles. If you've ever solved uh, a Sudoku puzzle, you know just how satisfying it is when when you suddenly realize that a certain cell has to have a certain number. You say, oh, you know, there's a there, there's a one, two, three in a row, and there's and there's a four, five, six in the column, and a seven and eight in the box. Ah, so it must be a nine. And uh, you you really feel good about yourself <laughs> when you when you come up with that. And uh, even people who think they don't really have any taste for logic uh, often enjoy doing things like Sudoku puzzles. So, uh, Simon, uh, I just know from reading about you that um, you were in a slightly different field of employment before you became uh, a Sudoku celebrity and the host of a very popular Sudoku YouTube channel. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit about your transition from one career to the other. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty unbelievable. I, I used to be an investment banker until um, April Fool's Day last year. Um, <laughs> And I'd spent a decade doing a job that um, I must have committed a heinous crime in a former life to uh, uh, to have deserved. And, um, you know, I, I was steadily becoming more and more disillusioned. And I started the channel with a friend, my friend Mark Goodlift, as, as a hobby. Um, and it started to get bigger and bigger. Um, and it got to a point where I realized, well, maybe, just maybe, there's a chance that there's enough people out there with an interest in this that it could it could make a living. So I took the plunge, um, well, as I say, 1st of April last year. And since then, it's been incredible. The growth has been absolutely incredible. I think, I think when I left, we had maybe 30 or 40,000 subscribers, and now we have a quarter of a million. Right. So, yeah, just to do a few other numbers besides that quarter of a million, 27 percent of that audience is in America. One of the videos has four point one million views. Uh, the channel has more than 40 million uh, views. And, and these Simon, I mean, these are basically a screen with the puzzle on it. And you're kind of down in one corner in what looks like kind of the Zoom stuff that we, we all do a lot of uh, nowadays. I mean, this is. Uh, and and then people are basically just watching the puzzle get filled in, correct? Yeah, that's that, that's exactly right. It's a uh, very low tech. Um, I think part of the enjoyment though is that people can play the puzzles themselves first, and also that these puzzles are they're not like the puzzles that you get in your newspaper, um, which almost always are created by computers. So what we do is showcase these these magnificent creations by the world's Sudoku constructors. And it, it's like doing a completely different puzzle. If you're used to doing a puzzle in a newspaper and you think you know what Sudoku is, then it's definitely worth giving a handcrafted puzzle a try, I think. We should talk a little bit about the the moment that vaulted you into the out of the sphere of the everyday online 
Sudoku solving YouTube celebrity and into possible immortality. Uh, and what we're going to do in just a second is is play a, a little clip that includes kind of a, a montage of do of you doing what you, you're doing. But what this was, and they do call it the miracle. <laughs> what this was was a, a puzzle which, as it appeared in front of you, didn't really seem like it had enough information to be solved. If I'm correct, there, there must be 81 squares, and I think there are only you only had numbers in two of those 81 squares. That's, that's exactly right, yeah. So, well, actually, maybe that's enough. Uh, is there anything else, else you want to say about it before we play the montage of like, what it sounds like as you're trying to solve this thing? <laughs> no, but just uh, even as you said it then, it sounds ridiculous. How can a Sudoku with only two numbers in it possibly have a solution? And how could a human being find the solution? Um, and that's that's the amazing thing about that puzzle is that you can find the solution. Anyone could find the solution who had even the basic rudimentary knowledge of, of Sudoku. And it is a miracle. It's an unbelievable miracle that that puzzle exists. <laughs> All right. So you're giving more credit to the creator and less credit to yourself. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's yeah. hear a little bit of, of what that sounded like. There is no way that this... Well, it might have a unique solution, but it's not going to be findable by a human being. Um, and although I can put a one in this box, in the central box. So now why do I think I can put a one in this box? Well, it's because of all these massive constraints on the grid. I don't believe it. That is a two. But the threes, which must be where we have to go now, because we know nothing at all about four, five, six, seven, eight or nine. I don't believe this. The threes are placeable from that absolute gibberish we had in the grid. What? This is, this is magic. This, we are watching magic unfold here. This is going to solve, isn't it? This is going to solve. I'm not sure I've got the adjectives to describe what is going on here. This is like, uh, this is like the universe is singing to us here. This is just absolutely unbelievable. So uh, uh, in a second, I want to have Jason react to this a little bit. But Simon, just to stay with you for a second, and particularly the penultimate thing you say in that montage, this is like the universe singing to us. So, and this kind of touches back, we, we actually re-aired a show yesterday that we did about just numbers and w whether numbers exist independently of human beings and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there are at minimum two participants in this story, the creator of the puzzle and the solver of the puzzle. You would be that latter person. But that remark of yours seemed to suggest that there might be at least a third party there, that, that, that there's some way in which, in the way that numbers actually often do seem a little bit mystical, that something else is going on. What, what did you mean when you said the universe is singing to us? Uh, just that there was something very profound about about what Mitchell Lee, who's the creator of the puzzle, seemed to have been able to do with it. It it wasn't like a normal puzzle. If, if you imagine somebody compiles a crossword, they create a whole set of clues and you fill in the clues. And it's very much a creation um, of the author. Whereas what Mitchell Lee seemed to have done is uncovered something that exists in nature and showed it to us in a way that where we could appreciate it. So He'd, he'd managed to figure out that this rule set allowed this beautiful thing to exist. And it was that that I was trying to communicate, probably not very well, but it, it, it felt, and it sometimes does feel quite profound when, when you, you realize that these construct, constructors have, have discovered these beautiful patterns and, and they're showing them to you. So we should say this happened in May. We are in a lockdown to a certain degree. People perhaps have a little bit more unallocated time. Uh, but even factoring for that, the, there was a quite a lot of excitement about this. And people wrote articles about how unexpectedly spellbinding it was to watch this puzzle being solved before one's eyes. Uh, but I'm guessing, Jason, in your case, it would have been pretty exciting to see something like that. I mean, maybe even as a teaching tool, right? In a way, what Simon is doing, I assume, is something that you're trying to teach when you teach logic. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I um, uh, I know the video that you're referring to, and uh, I, I enjoyed watching it myself. And yeah, there is something just very beautiful and very charming about how um, you know you, you basically have more information than you think you have. You know, and this is somewhat unusual sort of Sudoku puzzle uh, that you know the conditions you have 
uh, you know, the, the deductive consequences of, of the information that you have. Actually, even with just these two starting clues, uh, they force you to fill in the rest of the grid in a certain way. Now, th there's an interesting mathematical question here, which is that, you know, given a, you know, a Sudoku grid and certain rules, uh, what is the minimum number of clues, you know, that you need for a proper puzzle? Uh, and it turns out that in, in, in standard Sudoku, uh, it, the, the answer to that turns out to be 17. In other words, you can have 17 starting clues, and that will, you know, and, 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 you know in principle, that might be uh, sufficient. Um, uh, but, uh, but if you only have 16 clues, then, uh, then, then you're out of luck. Um, but if you put extra restrictions, right, in standard Sudoku, it's, you know, uh, you know, you can't have the same number twice in any row, column, or, or three by two box, but you could put additional conditions on it, and that gets the number of starting clues down. Now, I can't resist mentioning at this point uh, that my, uh, my good friend, uh, Laura Talman, who was actually my co-author on that uh, Taking Sudoku Seriously book, uh, she has published uh, a, a collection of Sudoku puzzles that she created with her, her husband, uh, Phil Riley, uh, called Naked Sudoku. And these are Sudoku variants where you actually have no starting clues. Uh, in other words, that the, the restrictions uh, on where you can place numbers in the cells are, are ultimately so tight that you need no starting clues. Uh, you just have a, a bare grid <laughs> you know, in front of you. Uh, so anyway, I can't resist plugging her book. Uh, that's uh, Laura Talman and Phil Riley. It's called Naked Sudoku. So, you know, um, Simon, one of the most logical people that I uh, ever met was a, a kind of a crime scene forensic specialist, uh, pretty well known, Henry Lee, although he's, his reputation has gotten a few dings and dents uh, to it lately. But what, what, watching him work, one of the things that I realized is so much of his method was uh, eliminating wrong answers. Was that part of how you did what you did with this particular puzzle? And is that part of, of Sudoku generally, is uh, discarding things that can't be right? Yes, absolutely. It's, t it's testing little hypotheses over and over again um, and trying to find an efficient way of reducing the possibilities for each cell. Um, that's exactly right. And, and and is there so that's but that all by itself wouldn't work, right? I mean, or at least you'd be there all day. Um, there's something else you you have to also maybe be looking for some other inference. I think it depends on the puzzle. I mean, in the miracle Sudoku, as as Jason says, there was there was some chessboard restrictions operating in the grid, so you couldn't have a digit that was a king's move in chess away from the same digit. And you couldn't have a knight's move um, within a digit either. And those sorts of restrictions play with your mind and you start seeing patterns differently to how you might do with a, a regular Sudoku. But it's still very much about eliminating possibilities. Mm. Um, and the remarkable thing about the miracle Sudoku is that the number of possibilities, certainly as regards the threes, for example, which were quite early on in the solve, they seemed astronomical. It seemed completely impossible to be able to um, solve the threes uniquely but that set of conditions on the grid actually operates incredibly powerfully and in the end you can and and as I say any, anybody with any affinity with Sudoku could solve the miracle Sudoku with a bit of time I would, be, I would I be willing to get, yeah, I would be in that small group of people who probably never could. I, I, we have to stop right now. I hate to stop right here, but uh, Simon Anthony, one of the two hosts on Cracking the Cryptic, a YouTube channel, Jason Rosenhaus. His books include Taking Sudoku, Sudoku Seriously and Learning to Pronounce Sudoku, the math behind the world's most popular pencil puzzle. Thanks to those of you who listened. Thanks to those of you who helped. <laughs>